Laura, one of the great questions humanity has had since we've uh, been sentient is how did this whole thing begin? Uh, and in recent decades, uh, uh, observational cosmology has really changed everyone's perception. Uh, uh, so let's focus on the beginning of the universe. And from your work as a, a quantum cosmologist, uh, what can you say about the, uh, the, the confidence level that you and your colleagues have about how this universe began? Uh, when it comes to the confidence level, that, that's... Uh uh, still very low, not not just for myself and my colleagues, but but anyone that ever came across that question: How did our universe begin? Um, theoretically, we we have um, a, a very um, good answer to, to the question. However, we, we are talking about the, the ultimate uh, nature, at least of, of uh, our universe. So it, it's uh, it's hard not to be humbled by that question as well. Um, do we know how the universe began? We, we can see observationally um, up to the first fraction of a second in, in our universe's existence. So up to that level, we, we have total confidence that we understand our universe, we, we know what happened. The big question is... But that's, that's from a theoretical point of view, because we can't see uh, prior to the ionization phase in terms of direct observation, right? Uh, that, that is true, but uh, we, we should be able to, to see even that, that part up, up to the, the first moment of existence uh, through um, other observational right. ways such as uh, um, the, the uh, 21 centimeter cosmology and, and there, there are a lot of, of ways to, to observe the universe all, all the way back to, to the uh, first moment of existence. And, and that is also the reason why this question of the origin of the universe has, has become frontier science and one of the most active areas of research at present because we, we have reached that level where we have to face the question, but where did that come from? What gave uh, the energy of, of uh, cosmic inflation. Was there anything before? Can we even ask the question of what was there before? And, and that brings about a lot of deep questions, not just about our universe, but about nature itself. Because to have the right to ask the question what was there before, we have to accept that there is such a thing as time. The, the very word before does not have any meaning outside of the context of time. So is time emergent or is time fundamental? Uh, that, that's one other question related to, to the issue of the origins of the universe. And obviously In, the space-time relationship that came from Einstein uh, absolutely. lends very strongly to that because if you don't yeah. have any space and there's space time, you don't have the kind of time that we have in our universe. Uh, that, that's absolutely correct. And, and uh, when, when it comes to that uh, origin, that, to that first moment uh, of our universe's existence, uh, we, we are willing to, to accept that uh, we can study it by, by quantum theory. The reason being that the universe was tiny. It, it was uh, one of the smallest objects one can imagine. Right. So it, 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 it makes sense to, to accept that uh, that structure can be studied with, with uh, quantum theoretical rules. So right now, what, what is the, uh, the, the feeling that the universe was in its very, er, the smallest it was, a much, order, many orders of magnitude smaller than the smallest particle that, that exists in the, nut in, in the, in the nucleus of, of an atom. It's far, far, far smaller than that. So yeah. 10 to the minus... 43 centimeters, yeah, which so is the Planck, Planck scale. The Planck yeah. scale, which is the, theoretically the smallest possible uh, thing that can exist in yeah. theory. Yeah. So 10 to the minus 43. And, and the question, what was there before that 10 to the minus okay, 43? So what so was it at that time? Uh, at that time, uh, we can think of the universe as, as a wave packet using the wave particle duality. It, it's uh, equivalently, we can also think of it as a quantum particle. But, but uh, that universe was, uh, that tiny universe, uh, had a very high concentration of energy and it was that energy that drove it in, into an explosion. The question becomes, what is that standard inflation theory? Yes. yes. Yeah. But but where did that energy come from? Why did we have to start that way? Uh, Sir Roger Penrose in the 70s uh, calculated mm. that the probability to start mm. with high energy inflation yeah, yeah. is ridiculously small. Yeah. It's 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123, 123 <laughs> uh, times. So that, it's that's... A, it's 100 and 
23 z zeros as a power. Exactly. As a so power, yeah. not ten, just as a number. <laughs> 10 to the power 10 and then another 123 right. zeros. Right. But uh, so that, that says that, that uh, the chance of our universe starting the way it is seems ridiculously small, nearly zero. And, and that brings about a lot of paradoxes like the Boltzmann brain paradox and, and so on. And the Boltzmann brain paradox quickly. Uh, the, the Boltzmann brain paradox, simply put, is that anything that, that we, we can envision might happen will happen because it will have a higher chance of, and of the Boltzmann existence. Boltzmann brain just suddenly is a third thermal variation that suddenly has a sentience, some kind of sentience there for a microsecond. E even <laughs> a, a macabre example, even a floating brain that uh, nucleates yeah, yeah. spontaneously out of nothing has a higher chance to, to <laughs> occur than, than the universe. Right. So that, that makes uh, scientists feel very uncomfortable because it, it seems to indicate that something very special produced the initial conditions for our universe to come into being. And, and that was part of the motivation why I, I was so drawn to, to that question. Uh, on the other hand, it, it's hard to see how can we even ask the question, why did we start with this universe without having a pool of many possible universes from which to start, from many possible initial conditions. And so that, that way of thinking uh, led me uh, towards the, the multiverse idea. But, but let, let's just stick with, with the quantum part. So we, we all agree there's nothing wrong uh, with applying quantum mechanics at, at the beginning of the universe so because small. the universe is so small. If you apply quantum mechanics, then uh, what, what you find out solving something similar to Schrodinger equation, uh, what you find out is not just one solution, one wave function that will eventually become a universe, but a whole family of them. And, and there is no criteria in nature that says, oh no, you can keep only this one, keep yours, but throw away the rest. So if you agree and accept that, that all the possible mathematical solutions one gets out of quantum mechanics have an existence uh, of, or a right to exist similar to, to our universe, then, then we have to accept that there is a whole uh, pool, ensemble of, of universes out there that underwent a similar evolution Started from that hours. initial... Starting from that wave packet mm -hmm. initial state. Right, now, but does that assume a so-called Everett multi-world assumption that when you have a, a, a wave function that uh, that um, it doesn't decohere into one, that it that all of them exist in some kind of abstract space? The, the starting point is, is, is very close in, in spirit to the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics, but, but uh, what happens next is, is, is not uh, the same. So according to Everett, Everett started from the same point. If you solve a Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, you find the family of wave right. functions of, of that will become universes. At every moment in time. At, at every moment and, and all of them have an... Now that's where the departure occurs. Every one of them has an equal chance of existence. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, uh, in the work uh, I've been doing in, in the theory of, uh, of the origin of the universe from a quantum multiverse, uh, what, what you find out is that if you follow these wave functions and, and follow their evolution, see what happens to them, then there is a selection criteria that takes place that does not give all of them an equal chance of existence. If, if we follow the dynamics of, of uh, gravitational degrees of freedom, which are given by the energy contained in, in each of these uh, wave packets, and the matter degrees of freedom, which are given by the quantum fluctuations that are always present, then, then it's very easy to see that what happens is locally every single wave packet will have the energy that is trying to, to make it explode, to make it grow, and it will have matter that is trying to crunch it into a black hole. Depending which one wins determines whether that initial quantum particle becomes a universe, grows large to, to uh, produce a classical universe, or it vanishes from existence, it becomes a terminal universe. Now this is not uh, uh, conventional wisdom at that no. point. This is your wisdom. Uh, that, that is my wisdom <laughs> based on, on very hard calculations. Okay. Yes. All right. I just want to, want to clarify. And, uh, so, yeah. But still, at the beginning of your universe, at the very beginning, you got a lot of stuff there. You, you have a, a quantum wave packet. Yeah. You have assumptions. Uh, obviously, you have quantum theory and its full-blown nature sitting there yeah. I in existence. And you have uh, this different weighting in, in your explanation. You have the different weightings between gravity and matter in this yeah. selection process. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Yes, and, and to make it work, to, to actually illustrate through a real calculation that, that uh, one can derive the answer to the question of the origin of the universe, uh, we consider the landscape of string theory uh -huh. to be that that field of energies that, that we, we need for these wave functions okay. to, to propagate through. So taking that as our working is example, then, then um, conceptually straightforward, calculationally is, is not straightforward, but um, conceptually you have a, a wave 
packet, a wave function of the universe, which is made up of many of such particles, quantum particles or, or waves that, that will eventually, or branches that will produce universes. They are propagating through this structure of energies given by, by the landscape of string theory. At this stage, we have everything we need to, to find the probability where, of, of uh, where these wave functions will settle, what energies will they pick out of, of this vast landscape of energies. That's done through solving the, the quantum equations, something uh, that in quantum cosmology is known then, uh, as the wheeler the wheat equation, but it, it's a very similar equation to to uh, the Schrodinger Schrodinger. equation. So once we find that solution, one, once we know where will these wave packets prefer to sit, which, which mm -hmm. vacuous, which energies will they choose out of this landscape, then, then we have the probability distribution for what will happen to, to the initial conditions of this pool of universes. But that's not the end of the story, because even then you, you get a very large number of universes uh, settling at all possible energies. At this all stage, the different laws of physics. Because uh, and different constants of nature. Yeah. So at, at this stage, the, the dynamics becomes extremely important because not all of these wave functions will produce universes. The ones that, that settle at very shallow energies, they will not be able to survive this back reaction of matter. They will never be able to grow, to explode. Mm -hmm. So they, they will become terminal quantum particles. Mm -hmm. But only the ones that, that settle at very high energies in the landscape, they, they will undergo cosmic inflation and, and produce a classical universe. Yeah. Still quite a lot of them, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.